Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you very much. My name is Jim. I'm an alcoholic, and I'm a satisfied customer of Alcoholics Anonymous. Very happy to be sober. I got sober on August 8th of 1980. I was uh, 17 years old, and I never found it necessary, necessary to go back out and prove what I already knew, and that was that I was an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. So I'm very pleased to be here today. And uh, it's been a wonderful conference, and uh, you know I want to thank the uh, Waikipa committee for asking me to come on out here, and uh, God saw fit to make things happen in my life that made it easy to be here. So thanks again, really. And um, you know, a lot of this it wouldn't be possible uh, because um, you know mainstream AA doesn't really look too well upon books that aren't published by AA. Uh, fortunately, the young people in AA will have an open mind that uh, some of the older people don't. So I'm grateful to be here. And it started with my friend Jay back there, who invited me to the first Yuri Pa in Stockholm in 2010 uh, to present on this, just like I am doing today. And again at Dublin. And I hope I get to see all of you at Copenhagen for the third Yuri Pa. It's really worth the trip. It really is. So thanks again. So, um, you know, I... I I came to Alcoholics Anonymous uh, oh, about three weeks before I went away to college. And uh, one of the books that was handed me, to me um, was the big book. And most of you are familiar. I'm actually gratified to hear that the big book is referenced so many times uh, in this conference. Um, you know, but one of my favorite lines is in the book. And... Um, it's on page 95, and it's with working with others. And it talks a lot about what this program is really all about. So if he is sincerely interested and wants to see you again, ask him to read this book in the interval. After doing that, he must decide for himself whether he wants to go on. He should not be pushed or prodded by you, his wife, or his friends. If he is to find God, the desire must come from within. You know, it's kind of interesting that they say the desire to find God must come from within. That defines sobriety. And it really underscores something that I truly believe, and that is AA is a program to help alcoholics find God, sobriety results. And um, over and over, when I look at this program in that way, it changes the way I do things. And ultimately, instead of treating the, um, treating the symptoms, I get to treat the underlying problem. And the underlying problem is mirrored in uh, how we named our fourth chapter in our book, We Agnostics. And that's one of the questions that I put forth to the people I sponsor. When we come to step two, I say to them, why did they uh, name that chapter We Agnostics? Obviously, people come to AA with the idea of God, but there it is, We Agnostics. You really can't get around it. And what it really means is that alcoholics uh, do their very best to live apart from God, whether they believe in God or not. And uh, what we do in AA is we establish that relationship with God through having a spiritual awakening through the 12 steps. And, um, you know, the 12 steps in the big book were, you know, developed after four years of Bill's sobriety. And what did they do over that four-year period before the big book was written? What they did was they read a lot of other books. And one of the other books that they read was the Sermon on the Mount, written by Emmett Fox. And uh, the Sermon on the Mount was uh, written and published in 1934, which coincidentally is the year that Bill got sober on December 11th. And... um, It was a book that was uh, given to newcomers throughout AA in both Akron and in New York in the early days leading up to the publishing of our basic text from which our society takes its name. And, uh, you know, there was a happy coincidence that took place. Um, What happened was um, Bill ended up sponsoring a guy named Al Steckman. And Al Steckman was the daughter of Emmett Fox's, um, excuse me, the son of, uh, Emmett, of Emmett Fox's uh, secretary. And um, 
So it was through this connection that Bill and the early AAs in New York started going to hear Emmett Fox speak at some of the largest venues in New York City, uh, the Hippodrome, Madison Square Garden, Carnegie Hall, and he used to back him in because he had a real message. And uh, the message was is that um, if you were to practice the discipline of the mind and change the thinking, uh, God can be in your, in your life and make real changes. Uh, one of the things that was pasted on Facebook this morning, and I'm a member of a Facebook group that uh, goes through a book called um, Around the Year with Emmett Fox, uh, the comment this morning uh, was talking about believing the untrue. And we're all sitting in this room because we have believed in the untrue. We've believed in the false over and over again. We believe that we could pick up a drink with impunity, and all of us found out one way or another that we can't possibly take, uh, do that. When we came to Alcoholics Anonymous, we had to come to the idea that we can't pick up a drink with impunity, that we're bodily and mentally different than our fellows. And uh, But the rest of our lives are very much the same, just like it talks about setting aside prejudice in Chapter 4 of our book, in ch where we talk about Step 2. We have to set aside prejudice against some of the ideas about God that we might have had. We might have to get rid of some of our old ideas. And most of our old ideas have centered around thinking that, uh, you know, life sucks, it's unfair, people are awful and try to take advantage of you, the next shoe is going to drop, you know, people die in threes, all this negative crap that we have embraced over and over again. And the funny thing is, it's, it's untrue. But our beliefs are what's important to us. It shapes how we interact with everybody around us. I like to tell a story about Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus sailed over here in 1492. And what did people believe in 1492? They believed that the world was flat. And over the course of that journey, there was many attempts at mutiny because the people who were sailing with Christopher Columbus believed deep in their heart that they would sail over the edge of the earth and be eaten by serpents. Now, all of us know today that the world is round, and that's not possible. However, they believed in the false, and that was their reality. Over and over again, I've had to peel back what I have found to be false to get the rea to the reality. And the reality is, is that I can't live apart from God and have happy, contented sobriety. And that's the message that's grown through the connection between Emmett Fox, the Sermon on the Mount, and the big book. So just to go into a little bit of the history, and, you know, before I go on further, to, to my left, there's a flyer for a retreat in Vermont that I'll be leading in March where I go into this in depth over the course of a weekend. There's also a reprint of an article by a guy named Igor S. from Connecticut who wrote about Emmett Fox that was published in the Grapevine. Um, there's also my card if you wanted to join the uh, Yahoo group that covers all this stuff and have access to all the material that I've printed over the years. Um, but Emmett Fox was born in Ireland in 19, uh, 1886, and uh, Bill Wilson was born nine years later. And, um, you know, Emmett Fox was born to a, a man who was a physician, who was a member of the English Parliament. Um, he was a, his... Uh, Parents were devout Catholics, and it took a lot for Emmett Fox to turn his back on his parents' faith because he understood deep down that he could have a personal relationship with God. Um, Emmett Fox attended a meeting in 1914 where the International New Thought Alliance was organized. And why that's important is that um, deep down, Alcoholics Anonymous is part of the New Thought when you take a look through the book, and it talks about the terms describing God as um, universal mind, uh, things of that nature, that wasn't the way God was referred to until the New Thought Movement really came into its own. Uh, 1931, uh, Emmett Fox emigrated to the United States and became the minister of the Church of the Healing Christ in New York City. And, um, you know, it was from that platform that he started giving talks that challenged everybody to think differently about their lives. Um, in August of 1934, the Sermon on the Mount was published. And, uh, you know, as a newcomer, I was handed that book. 
31 years ago, uh, told that, you know, there's a companion to the big book that I could learn an awful lot about, the spiritual experience. And, uh, you know, when we talk about the spiritual experience, uh, and some people say, well, it's the spiritual part. It's like saying it's the wet part of the ocean. The uh, spiritual experience is what this is all about. It shapes the way that we interact with everybody around us. Um, so in 1936, uh, Bob Steckman starts to work with Bill, Bill to get sober. And uh, Bill and the rest of the gang start going to Emmett Fox's um, lectures. And uh, those are where some of the ideas that came about uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, it's funny. We, we think that we kind of, you know, invented a lot of this stuff. And what we've done is we've begged, borrowed, and stolen from everybody around us, packaged everything into a way that um, alcoholics can digest. Uh, but there are universal uh, principles that we get to see all over the place. So one of the things... One of the things that we talk about a lot in our program is those wonderful promises that we find. Um, but you know what? The, the idea of promises wasn't really invented by us. There's some promises on page 130 of the Sermon on the Mount. And just think about these things when I read them off. As soon as you obtain the spiritual consciousness, you will find that all things indeed work together for good that those who love good, good or God. You will experience perfect health, abundant prosperity, complete and utter happiness. Your health will be so good that mere living will in itself be an expressible joy. The body, no longer the burden to be dragged about that so many people find it, will be as though it were shod with winged shoes. Your prosperity will be such that you need not take the question of finance into consideration at all. Does that remind anybody of a certain promise in the big book? You will always have all the supply you'll need to carry out any of your plans. The world will turn out to be full of charming people, all too anxious to help you in every way. Others will come into your life only for good. You will find yourself occupied with the most delightful and extreme activities of the most widely useful kind. All your energy and all your faculties will find full scope for their expression, and in short, you will develop the completely integrated and fully expressed personality of which modern psychology dreams. Does anybody want to sign up for any of that? Put your hands up. Let's see it. Come on. We have a nice enthusiastic crowd here, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> You know, and um, another book that uh, Emmett Fox uh, is quoted in is a book about his life story, uh, and it's written by the woman who succeeded him as the uh, rector of that church. And he, he gave these points to live by. So uh, listen to these and, and think of, you know, how, if they apply or you've heard these somewhere else before. So Emmett Fox gave these following points to live by. Look for the best in each person and situation. Live in the present and let go of the past. Forgive without exception, including yourself. Work to the very best of your ability. Work at having a healthy body and harmonious surroundings. Be of service to others without interfering. Share the knowledge of truth with others. Refrain from criticism and gossip. Pray and meditate 15 minutes daily. Claim spiritual understanding for yourself. Give your first thought to uh, in the morning to God. Speak a positive word for the world daily. Know that life can be changed for the better by understanding scientific prayer, which is the lifting of your consciousness. Even in our basic texts, they tell us upon awakening, you know, uh, we need to plug into this power right away if we're going to expect to uh, really take full advantage of what AA has to offer. And, you know, I, I didn't do this from day one. I have to be honest. Uh, for the first couple of years I was sober, I lived my life as if I was being shot out of a cannon every morning. I got up at the very last possible moment with the last dime in my pocket, the last ounce of gas in my car, and I would race down the shoulder of the road and give everybody the finger while I was driving down the road trying to get to work on time. I would get to work late. The boss would be pissed off. I'd have to borrow money for lunch. Um, it's not a way to really embrace serenity from the very beginning of the day. You know, my sponsor, another man who um, really embraced this book, uh, turned around and said, you know, Jim, why don't you try getting up 15 minutes earlier? Why don't you try filling up your car when it gets down to a quarter of a tank instead of how far below E you can go? <laughs> Why don't you try not spending every dime on Friday night chasing after girls? 
you know, and I started to do those things. I started to show up on time or early for work. The boss got off my back. I wasn't harried all the time. And then my sponsor says, when you're driving down the Long Island Expressway, going to work, why don't you try turning the radio off for 10 miles? So anybody could do that. So, you know, I, I turn the radio off. I wait for 10 miles to pass by. I turn WBAB back on. And uh, missing the whole idea that I might consider my plans for the day. What am I going to be up against? You know, all these little things add up to having a serene existence in sobriety. And I am able to face life without having this craziness that goes on. And it's because of the principles that I found in the Sermon on the Mount and in the big book. Um, you know, today I, I have a, a very high-pressure job. I run the third largest shopping mall in the United States. Uh, I, you know, I manage to do a very little staff. I also have five other facility managers reporting to me. I work on the World Trade Center redevelopment. I sponsor a gaggle of people. Um, I have a full life. And I get to the, I get to the office early. I post a big book study on the internet, which I get to correspond with over 5,000 people each day. Um, you know, and, and I get right. I, I feel some phone calls from sponsees at 8:30 when the phone starts ringing. The first words out of my mouth aren't "Oh shit!" It's "How can I be of service?" It's a stark contrast to the guy who came to Alcoholics Anonymous because of these principles. Because I stopped believing in the false. And what do I believe in today? I get to believe all those wonderful promises that I just read out from page 130. I get to be of service. I change my mind about what I do for a living. You know, look, I didn't set out to be the manager of operations for a mall. That wasn't what I thought to be this wonderful, fulfilling existence. However, it makes this possible. <laughs> It makes it possible for me to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. It gives me the wherewithal to, uh, to be here today and uh, to f support all the service I get to do. And ultimately, the most important thing that I do each day is carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, what's nice about uh, the way we have this structured, and unlike most of the other um, workshops that we've had here over this weekend, is that there's an opportunity for any or all of you to ask me a question, to make a comment, uh, to share something, um, you know, because ultimately this is something that you don't get to hear about every day. And uh, it's important that we avail ourselves of all the spiritual avenues that are available to us. I will not fence myself in with um, books that are conference approved because there's a lot more out there. And even our basic text tells us that, you know, we should look at other books wherever possible. And, uh, you know, this is one of the books. Um, another book I have found very important to me is um, The Spirituality of Imperfection. It changed the way I looked at other people instead of demanding perfection from every one of them, which is a, a losing game. Uh, I'm able to cut everybody some slack today. Um, you know, people don't need to hear about how I think they should lead their lives. However, if they do ask me, I can offer something in the way of experience and not an opinion. Um, you know, so if any of you are willing to join us at the Wilson House on uh, March 24th and 25th in East Dorset, Vermont, it's, uh, it's an experience just to go there, too. Uh, I'm grateful that they asked me to run a retreat at least once or twice a year there uh, because it is a living memorial to one of our co-founders and a real spiritual place. Um, you know, and, and I'm grateful for all these wonderful opportunities for sharing this wonderful message. Thank you. I did that with uh, getting all teared up. Jay's heard me speak before. I usually get all emotional and stuff. So, I mean, does anybody have any questions about the uh, things that Emmett Fox teaches or the Sermon on the Mount? Yes. Okay, let's talk about the Golden Key. Actually, it's a nice little pamphlet that I hand out to my sponsees. And uh, roots of it can be found in AA2. The, the, basically, what the golden key is telling us is that to stop thinking about our problem and think about God instead. Because what most of us do is we have a problem in our lives, 
and then the squirrel cage goes inside of our head. And we think about 7,000 different ways we can approach it and fix it instead of understanding that the real, the real power is God. Um, and the idea also is that the more thought that you give to your problem, the more power that you give to it. And ultimately, you want to get rid of that thought, that problem as soon as possible. So if we want to turn that over to God, we should do so without looking over our shoulder. And that's ultimately what the, the, the golden key says. Um, the Ten Commandments, which we require a long, lengthy uh, answer, but uh, the long and short of it is the Ten Commandments establish what our relationship is with God. With the first, uh, uh, with all of it, where it talks about we are His children ultimately, and uh, any real parent would take care of their children. And uh, it's understanding, you know, how we interact with our fellow man. Anybody else? Yes. Hi, Trey. Uh, in a pride, and I can't get through the stumbling block of having good fruits with some of those responsibilities. Uh, and I can't make it a day and a half with those things. Just a big interest in some of My experience is that I've had to suspend disbelief. The question is um, that he approaches the seven-day mental diet with the idea that it's impossible, that he can't possibly uh, get through it. And uh, with any of our endeavors, whatever it happens to be, we have to suspend the idea of disbelief that we can't possibly do it. Most of us came to AA thinking we couldn't possibly be sober, and yet look at us now. Because we spent suspended disbelief, we gave the possibility of it being successful. Anything that I've gone into where I said it can't possibly happen, it does not. However, if I go into it with the idea that I could possibly be successful at it, it can happen. So I have to take myself out of the equation. Yes? One of the issues that I have that I'm preaching to do with is to look at things simple um, and presenting, like you said, in a way that um, I can't argue with it. You know, it's like so obviously true. Um, and, uh, sometimes with me, with outside reading, I have trouble with the idea that uh, it's a writing of scripture and it's interpreted in so many different ways by different groups, for instance, the Bible. Uh, I've never read so many times, and I'd really like to, um, but I, I just have trouble sometimes because I don't know how to uh, approach the determining validity of the interpretation that he's writing. So I'm wondering how you've done that over the years, uh, coming to an understanding and, uh, you know, a, your, your way of determining validity of scripture writing, spiritual approaches. When I talk about the Sermon on the Mount, uh, one of the things that I've done over the years is I've created a glossary and references guide for the Sermon on the Mount, and mainly because the book was written quite a while ago by a man who grew up in the United Kingdom, and there's a lot of references and uh, terms that people don't understand. Uh, I don't have copies of that with me, but if you go to Yahoo and you type in Sermon on the Mount uh, with underscores between the words, it'll bring you to a Yahoo group where that exists. So you can send me an email. My card's over here. Uh, but it helps to you know get some ideas about it. Um, there's been many, many different interpretations of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Oswald Chambers did one, too. And he was widely read by the people in Akron. Um, you need to find something that works for you, ultimately. What, what, what really works for me with Emmett Fox is he took the whole, you know, the glorification of Christ out of the picture and talks about the philosophy that underlies it. To me, that makes all the sense in the world, and I've embraced it. Everybody in this room has a little bit of different perspective on how they approach all of it. Uh, but with any endeavor, 
trying to go in with as an open mind as possible is going to be the best thing you possibly do. Thanks. Is it, you had your hand up over here, right? Hi. Uh, my name is Julian. I'm not Julian. so much for sharing that and and that's how I started the retreats that I do is that I would take small groups of people through this book over the course of about 13 weeks uh, you know usually eight or ten people and we go through the whole book together it's no different than the big book it's a textbook you know and you get so much out of studying it together and it's just taking the time out and bringing people who are like-minded together thanks that was fantastic yes <laughs> Emmett Fox has been called a lot of things, and I think that's one of the terms that he's been called the uh, father of modern metaphysical thinking, uh, teaching. And uh, the power through constructive thinking really introduces the real discipline of the mind in that he talks about it in another pamphlet too. It's called building the mental equivalent of your life. So just as much as you go to you go to an architect and say, I want to build a five bedroom ranch with three uh, three bathrooms and it's gonna be set on a hillside. That man has in his mind the picture of what that's gonna look like. And he takes the time to draw up the plans of how that is going to be built by a general contractor or a builder. But it all starts out with that mental idea of what that is. And we need to build the mental equivalent of our lives in our minds first before we can enjoy it on this plane. They talk about the fourth dimension of experience. And that's what it's all about, is you do the work in the fourth dimension, and on the third you get to see the results. So you can really tell how spiritual somebody is by what their life looks like, because it's from within, is expressed outward. Thanks for that question. Yes. Hi, John. I like how that process is, don't take my work with try very practical, like, you don't have to do what I'm saying to try it. Of course, it's going to action. You know, give this thing a chance. My experience is work. And uh, I just I just had one question, though. Is, is there a difference between these he, he scientific for the treatment, well, I'm treating the of the work. Is there a difference between the two of the very You know, it's more or less interchangeable. You know, the treatment is to pray scientifically, which is to turn it over to God and let it go. And then further treatment is to not look over the shoulder and watch how God, how well God is doing in solving your problem. But knowing 
that it will be taken care of. Believing <laughs> deep in your heart that whatever the solution will be, will be taken care of. And, and avoiding the idea that we can outline what the solution is. I've had the dubious honor of being laid off about a dozen times in sobriety. And, um, you know, early on, I would say to myself, oh, it's this job with this company, and if I don't get it, then... But, you know, after a while, I would say to, in my prayers, God, you will, you will take care of my lack, and you will see fit what's the best way to do so. And then all kinds of wonderful things started coming into my life when I stopped limiting God. So that's really the essence of the treatment is don't limit God. Don't predict what the outcome happens to be. Know that you will be taken care of uh, as God's child. Thanks. Yes. Um, Rob, I'll call Hi, Rob. Uh, can you share a little bit about your knowledge and experience with the size of the curve or something like this with illness? Of a physical illness. Yeah, the, the question is, what is your experience with Emmett Fox's um, using scientific prayer to overcome physical illness? And, um, you know, in the broader strokes, we know of people who hold on to anger and resentment and fear, and it gets expressed in their lives physically. And over and over again, I've seen people turn around from that kind of a state where it gets expressed in their physical body, when they've changed the mentality on the physical plane, everything changed. Emmett Fox actually grew up as a sickly child. And uh, he overcame his own physical uh, handicaps by changing his thought about life and what his position was with God and his fellow man. Uh, but also Emmett Fox would often say that the you know, doctors are, can be the best help of all. That, you know, they, we have real treatments for things and we shouldn't shy away from them. I hope that answer your question. Don't tell me you're all talked out. Oh. Yes, hi. That's a great comment, and I've had that question posed to me by some of my sponsees because they fall back into that disbelief, you know. The funny thing is the problem has been removed. I wouldn't drink whether I could or not anyway because it holds no, you know, promise for me whatsoever. And to me, that's the miracle. So it's kind of a hollow question of, you know, let me try to skewer the teacher whenever they come up with that. Is another hand here? Yes. Um, well, that's funny, Change that. I mean, 
if that you have the same kind of experience when it comes to Absolutely, and let me relate a story uh, about that. Um, the uh, the biggest pain in the ass tenant we have in that mall is Nordstrom. They're very high maintenance, difficult. Uh, when I got to working at Garden State Plaza, uh, my boss would basically like hide in his office when this woman named Serene came down to complain about stuff. So, you know, I met with her, and I was supposed to do a large construction project right outside their front door, and it was going to go on for weeks. And, you know, I talked to her, and I told her what I would do and give her information, what have you. And the project went well, and but it, it went over by about a week, and we had to do some more to me work. I mean, it wasn't that big a deal, but she demanded to have a meeting with me. And I said, sure, come on down. And I invited my boss, who decided to take the day off instead. And, um, and I sat down with her and a couple of her cronies, and she starts doing this. You know, you could have done this, and this went on too long, and you took more parking spaces than you, um, than you said. And the little part of me wanted to say, well, I've run a hell of a lot more construction work than you've ever seen, so buzz off. But the concept of resist not evil came into play. And I said to her, you're right. I could have done better. I apologize. And she was spoiling for a fight. She wanted me to look bad in front of her superiors. And when I said that, it took everything off the table. And why? Because I didn't find it necessary to defend my ego, and I didn't need to get into the ditch with her by exercising that idea of resist not evil. Because the only strength that evil has against me is the power that I give it to it. And so it changed everything. And she didn't clap after that. You had your hand up. Oh, yeah, I was wondering, so how was the vendor box doing that? I'm sorry? How was he doing that? Uh, let's see, he died in 1951, and so that he was 65 years old. Yes? You got that picture of him? Somebody mistake me for Emmett Fox in Ireland when I ran a retreat over there in October. <coughs> we got a good laugh out of that. I have a question. I know, uh, unfortunately, I'm obsessed with work life. So, I mean, I don't work in the auto Two lines out of the big book. One of the back of the story was the last page is talking about the guy who's in the middle of them. He could not or would not see all the way of life and kill himself. And uh, how it works, uh, I don't know if you can or will not. And I've seen, I don't know if he literally took that moment and talked, I believe he did, because I've seen it several times. <laughs> that idea when he's talking about who he will, that they can't, some can't get sober, some just cannot grasp what he's called will not. Uh, is there any other uh, direct, uh, close to maybe the rules and stole from him and talked to him? The one that really stands out is the term spiritual awakening, which before Emmett Fox wrote the Sermon on the Mount was virtually unknown, and yet it appears in both places. Um, and, and there are several others, which uh, I could probably go into, but you should come to the retreat and you get the whole thing. Yeah, I assume Bill just kind of Yeah, he, you know, he, he was the master at uh, adopting ideas and putting them into language that we can understand and, and could accept. That's great. Knew it. Thank you. Yes? Okay, I have two questions. Uh-oh. Um, the Beatitudes, how do they parallel? I think that the Beatitudes had a lot to do with how our principles came to be developed. Um, and if you you know you read the front end of the Sermon on the Mount, it really talks about this stuff too. And also, you know, some of the ideas presented in the Beatitudes, uh, and the Fox expounds on to really give you the inner meaning of what they are. You know, um, and that's one thing that I really enjoy when I'm reading it. Your follow up question is.
how is spiritual progress really how is it You know, the, the way I got around that personally was changing my idea of, you know, Jesus to correspond with what Emmett Fox talks about. And he doesn't, you know, spend all the time you know, glorifying, you know, Christ, the Son of God, blah, blah. He talks specifically about the philosophy that Christ represented, the, the, the lessons that he taught. And then Emmett Fox also talks about the fact that you can find these same ideas in all the major religions. I mean, he references um, Hinduism, Buddhism, and many other uh, religions. And these are all universal ideas. It just so happens that Emmett Fox was part of the New Thought Movement and a branch of Christianity. Uh, but I, what I need to do is get rid of the prejudice I have against that so I can accept the, the valuable ideas that are put forth in the book. So thanks. That was a good question. Yes. Yes, you. I wish I could cover this material in such a short period of time. Um, the shortest period of time I'm able to go through all this is really about six or seven hours. I'll be doing a three-hour thing in Stockholm at the end of April. Um, but to really, to really summarize about all this, it is changing the way we think. Ultimately, how we think about God, about our relationship with God, our relationship with other people, the necessity to clear our channel between me and him, um, to look at other people in a different way than we always have, really to set aside those old ideas that have handicapped us, um, and to adopt a new attitude towards our fellow man. Um, you know, it's funny, when I, when I started reading this book, I stopped telling people how to live their lives. And I spent a lot of time doing that. I really did. And uh, all that did was push everybody away. And instead, I let my example, my demonstration, a, a word that shows up in the big book many times, speak about what I believe. And then people come to me and ask me about it. You know, and that's really the message of this book. You can't cast your pearls before swine. You can't tell people this wonderful thing that you found. You can show them. And by that attractive example, you get to bring people close to you that want it to. So I'm sorry that we don't go more in depth into it. But, you know, anybody who hasn't read this book, pick it up. Use a highlighter. Get a pen. And, and join with other people to read it. Thank you. Jay. And I apologize for doing this. Uh, and it's just so inspiring to me to see young people all over embracing the same text and the same literature that Bill and Dr. Bob used to formulate our basic text of the Um I just have two comments, really. One, I really appreciate what you said because I was sitting here going, I wonder how many people are here to do it.
response to them to Jesus and to Christ and the Beatitude. So I thought, no, no, no. But then I said, I'm going to finish this, and there better be something at the end of this to be able to be worthwhile. And it was, because when I got past the big chunks of that stuff, and then it opened up into these other things that were embracing of a lot of outside thought and a lot of open I don't like the else, but I've had a hard time with prayer meditation recovery. I've asked so many people when I first hear how they meditated and their response was it's a personal thing. And I said, I have a personal finger. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jay. In the back and brown. Yeah, my name is Mike. And, uh, I'm calling. Mike. Um, as uh, kind of put it into, into the piece of phrasing, so uh, as uh, Bill, Bob, and the other dozen so folks that helped create the text that we had in different forms of thought that were going on, why is it that, uh, that uh, this particular piece of literature continues to be talked about. There were so many that there were available to them that they did draw from, and not just from religious life. And there's a specific reason why we don't uh, associate our organization with any other organization, whether it be religious, political, or so on and so forth. You know, we, as, uh, and I have no, very clear, no qualms about anybody's personal experience with the topic. I understand that uh, you know this has been a, a great book of, of discussion for many years, but I am concerned that you know, especially anyone here who hasn't read uh, these texts and what have you, or haven't been through these steps and things like that, that they're not being confused. So how do you uh, separate you know you know uh, the idea of what you know, you're obviously the the, the phrasing that you're using is God. Western thought up there. You know, how, do, how do we convey this without? I mean, it's not what comes through, but definitely not. You know, it's kind of you know, to deal with for a long time. So how does this fit in how Paul is on today? Where do we, where, how do we place this into our spiritual walk today? With all the things that are available to you, rather than, you know, like, what I, what I tell people I sponsor is that you want to use conference-approved literature, namely the big book, and if you want to expand your journey, there are many different avenues to do so. And our basic text tells us that too. You know, there are many useful books also. You know, I'll let your priest, minister, rabbi recommend a few. Let's paraphrase it. We all know that they're not uh, AA, that they're not conference approved. However, we don't have a monopoly on God. Uh, I actually wrote an article for the uh, Grapevine some time ago, and it's called The Spiritual Kindergarten. Alcoholics Anonymous ultimately is a spiritual kindergarten. We get to learn the rudiments of whatever faith that we have here. But even Bill told us we should go on to expand, to um, grow in understanding and effectiveness. And this is just one avenue. It just happens to be one that was very popular and still continues to today. Yes. Uh, just to go deep on that, there's a lot of Yeah, right. You know, and half the room raised their hand. 
I read that they read this, you know, and, and, and as soon as they passed on me, that's that's a miracle. Um, and I totally forgot what my question was. <laughs> no, we're not done yet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it was really, maybe, it wasn't even really a question. If we, if we go down on the Sermon on the Mount, we brought you the experience of Jesus. You know, it's an experience. We brought you the experience. And, and, and you want to see that. Thanks. Yes. My name is Nick. I'm not Bob. Nick. Hey, hey, I'll tell you, I got uh, in the first part of the sermon, I, I come to A with a lot of fixed ideas. I was raised in my family home, from very uh, uh, structured, organized religion. And I talk about fixed ideas about what Jesus Christ was with organized religion in, based off of a certain perception of the alcoholic. Um, it was a huge eye opener for me, uh, and it really helped me put down my prejudice reading the first part of the book of what these principles are that are taught. You know, I always thought of organized religion as you know, temples and churches and, and uh, you know, money and, and, uh, and control. Uh, you know, I, so I've always, you know, gone against those establishments. Uh, but that first part of the book really helped, helped me set aside my prejudice for what he was being taught. Uh, I, I would highly encourage anybody to sit down and read it because it, once again, my fixed ideas are what's really killing me and keep me sick. Being enlightened these teachings, uh, it, was, it, it changed me. So that's all I to say. Thank you. Yes. With the full set and the original purpose, it's a philosophy. Actually, there are two very separate ideas in organizations, and they'd be ideas. I'm sorry? Uh, if there, was there any correlation or interaction between Emmett Fox and the Oxford groups, which there really was none? Yes. I know that Emmett Fox covers the Proverbs in Around You with Emmett Fox, and he selects a couple of them in there. I don't know, I don't know if they did that in early AA. They probably did. Yes? I do is I tell stories and I don't attribute the ideas to any particular text or anything like that uh, just like that story about you know Columbus you know belief in the untrue and I do that over and over again without actually talking about what the particular literature is that it comes from all that I know is it illustrates the spiritual idea sufficiently that people grasp it and I'll do that in meetings over and over and over again um, when you read the, um, if you get a chance to read the spirituality of imperfection, that's what it's about. 
It's storytelling to talk about spiritual truths. And it's the best way to convey an idea is to tell a story that people can connect with. And uh, that's exactly what Bill does in the big book, too. Thank you. Yes, you have. Uh, I come from uh, one of Mexico, and I'm, I'm so uh, this is so interesting because over there, we, you know, we barely and very brief the literature of AA, right? and obviously this goes way beyond that level. And um, I see at your level, uh, and I'm you know trying to be conscious at what level am I at? See people or look for people that obviously more years older than me and have read the big book. Some Americans in my life also in Mexico that live there. And I try to reach out, not reach out, but ask for the help. Then they know about the book, obviously. Uh, so we got 42 years sober, he knows about the book. I guess that this would be a question, but it would be like a difference. And if there's any doubt, the question of how far should I go to found my strategy? You should go to Mexico. <laughs> you should get into that culture and see the lack of interest in maybe growing spiritual. And when I see the difference in my country and the difference here in America, maybe it's the age difference. It's complicated. You know, I'm a bad At least I can fit myself. <laughs> You know, what I can say is that growing and getting to that point where uh, I have those seven days uh, not thinking negative stuff, something like that. But uh, I don't know, just thank you for the uh, for your sharing and your knowledge of this. And for your interest, when you were an alcoholic and now, before you feel like you're more still an alcoholic, I guess. <laughs> Recovered, but yes, an alcoholic. But you continue the path, you continue the road, and uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes, you. Yeah, I, my suggestion is I. Uh, What's your name? Uh, Nils, I'm alcoholic. Hi, Nils. Hi, Sue. Uh, I, we have a study group in the Stockholm Swedish group uh, where we study this book, and it's the uh, best experience I've had. So it's, uh, it really gets you thinking. Uh, Thank you, Nils. In the back. I 
I'd invite all of you to come to the interaction group in Manhattan. We meet on uh, 95th Street between 5th and Madison. We have a big book step study at 6.30 at night on Wednesdays. And we talk about God freely there, but we don't talk about our, the specifics about our beliefs about God. But we talk about what the results have been in having those beliefs in our lives. So it's a room full of people who talk about uh, what their demonstration is. And they talk about you know what they've overcome in their lives. But they don't say it's because of Jesus Christ, Son of, uh, Son of God, or anything like that. They talk about their relationship with a higher power or God, and that's it. They don't say anything about their specific um, relationship with God because it's a highly personal thing. And we do more harm than good in Alcoholics Anonymous by saying things such as Jesus is the only way, or you really should be a Buddhist because that's the only way to stay sober, or whatever the case may be. You know, um, and whatever anybody's personal choice is, Emmett Fox came up with the ultimate test, and that is, does it work? Regardless of what the belief is, does it work? And if you're a happy camper and it works, who's going to argue with that? Does it mean that everybody's got to follow your way? Absolutely not. You know, nobody has to. I liken it to going to um, uh, Baskin Robbins. Everybody's there for ice cream, but not everybody's there for Rocky Road. And not everybody likes the flavor of Jim Kelly either. And that's okay. You know, I try to let my demonstration speak about what I have found in AA. And if somebody wants to talk about it and ask me about it, I'm very happy to talk about it. But in meetings, I try to be as um, generic as possible because I might lose an opportunity to carry a beneficial message otherwise. That's a great point. Thank you so much for bringing it up. Yes. started on a bleak November day when Emily Thatcher sat across from Bill and told him, why don't you choose your own conception of God? That is what changed everything. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Anthony? Yeah. I just want to hear about 
Oh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> I, I could tell a story about... Um, I could tell a little story about that, and it really doesn't encompass everything that you asked. Um, it's a story about when... Uh, when I first came, I, I started working at uh, Garden State Plaza for Westfield, and uh, I wasn't happy about being there. And I was having, a, you know, a difficult time working in that environment with people I, you know, really didn't want to work with. And uh, until one day in meditation, I started to see that the reason why I was there was to be a demonstration of God's power in my life that the work itself took on a different meaning that day. That I started to see that the work that I did only enabled me to carry a message. Now, none of those people know I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous. Nobody at work. Today, and face anything that comes down the pike without any fear, uh, keeping a modicum of dignity throughout, and on occasion, somebody will come to me and ask me, well, how does that happen? Four other people in that position burned out in six months, and yet you were able to do this. And, you know, when it comes down to it, it goes back to what I read at the very beginning on page 95. This is it. And what it says there is that basically we're here to find a power greater than ourselves, that we have to change the people we bring to AA, and not just change the outsides, but the insides. And once I find a relationship with God that works, everything else is a piece of cake. Everything is a piece of cake. And so now today, my prayer is, place me at the place where I could be of maximum service to those about me. Not give me X, Y, and Z and cash and prizes. All that stuff comes, but only if I ask to be of service to others. So it really doesn't answer the question very well, but it does talk, talk a lot about how I've gotten to that place. Yes? I had a great call to talk up. All right. Uh, Welcome. I've been, uh, I've been following that idea for like 10 years, so I'm probably 17 now. And uh, over the last uh, over the last nine months,
Thank you. Right in front of you. Yes. Hi, Meredith. Hi, Meredith. Hi, Meredith. Um, yourself that's probably the best thing I could possibly tell you don't read it by yourself find a couple of people who've actually read it before meet with them talk about it because there you'll be able to talk about what you're concerned about you know what are the stopping blocks that won't let you accept some of these ideas um, the other thing is reread chapter four in the big book where it tells us to set aside our old ideas our prejudices against religious terms because you know that's the one thing that hope help us to open our minds up and um, we're out of time which is probably unusual for one of these things I really do appreciate everybody coming out and let me turn it back to our leader who will take us out <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.